A reading from the book of Genesis. Israel set out with all that was his. When he arrived at Bathsheba, he offered sacrifice to the God of his father Isaac. There God, speaking to Israel in a vision by night, called, Jacob, Jacob. He answered, Here I am. Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you a great nation. Not only will I go down to Egypt with you, I will also bring you back here after Joseph has closed your eyes. So Jacob departed from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel put their father and their wives and children on the wagons that Pharaoh had sent for, this, for his trans, transport. They took with them their livestock and the possessions they had acquired in the land of Cana. Thus Jacob and all his descendants migrated to Egypt, his sons and his grandsons, his daughters and his granddaughters, all his descendants he took with him to Egypt. Israel had sent Judah ahead to Joseph so that he might meet him in Goshen. On his arrival in the region of Goshen, Joseph hitched the horses to his chariot and rode to meet his father Israel in Goshen. As soon as Joseph saw him, he flung himself on his neck and wept a long time in his arms. And Israel said to Joseph, At last I can die, now that I have seen for myself that Joseph is still alive. Bebum Domini. The salvation of the just comes from the Lord. Trust in the Lord and do good, that you may dwell in the land and be fed in security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will grant your heart's request. The Lord watches over the lives of the wholehearted. Their inheritance lasts forever. They are not put to shame in an evil time. In days of famine, they have plenty. The salvation just comes from the Lord. Turn from evil and do good, that you may abide forever. For the Lord loves what is right and forsakes not his faithful ones. The salvation The salvation of the just is from the Lord. He is their refuge in time of distress, and the Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them, because they take refuge in him. Let 
Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Mateo. Gloria Tibi Domine. Jesus said to his apostles, Behold, I am sending you like sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and simple as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to courts and scourge you in their synagogues. And you will be led before governors and kings for my sake, as a witness before them and the pagans. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. You will be given at that moment what you are to say, for it will not be you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will hand over brother to death and the father his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but whoever endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to another. Amen, I say to you, you will not finish the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Verbum Domini. Laus Tibi Christe. Today, in the United States, we celebrate uh, the memorial of Saint Kateri Tekawitha. Pope Benedict uh, Meredith made her, canonized her saint in 2012. She's the first Native American woman uh, to be canonized. She was born in 1656 in what is now upstate New York in Orisville. She had a Mohawk father and a Christian mother she, the parents were killed by a smallpox epidemic when uh, Kateri was four years old and it left, she survived, and, but she left her face disfigured and impaired her eyesight. And she learned the faith uh, from her mother and from the Jesuit missionaries in the area and she was eventually baptized at the, at the age of 20. And she had to move to another village after the death of her parents at four years old, and she lived with uh, two aunts, and uh, the uncle was a, a chief of the next village. <clears throat> and she suffered persecution during this time. She did extreme penances. She was at times rejected by the village, uh, threatened with torture, and eventually led to her leaving that village about five miles away from modern-day Orisville, uh, and she made this 200-mile journey up to the area of Montreal to St. Francis Xavier Mission there. 200 miles, it took her two months to make this journey. But she was only, she was, you know, about 20 years old and at that time, and her motto was, who can tell me what is most pleasing to God that I might do it? Sounds very uh, Jesuit. Like I think of Ignatius and his conversion, you know, he saw, read about the lives of the saints and said, why can't I do what they did? You know, they, they show us the path. Why can't I do that? And she did, as I mentioned, great penances. She prayed much, they said, before the Blessed Sacrament. They have some Jesuit missionaries wrote about her, so we have some accounts of her life. I would kneel in the cold chapel for hours praying. She loved the rosary. She wore a rosary on her neck and prayed it often. She taught the young children, served the sick of the mission. And she, one of her devotions was to make crosses out of sticks and place them in the forest. And so when she was out and things, she would be reminded to pray and to reflect on our Lord's passion. And on March 25th, 1679, she was 23 years old, she made a vow of perpetual virginity. This is the first recorded vow of such kind you know, among the Native Americans. And she was risking a lot to do this, you know, not to embrace marriage. 
Uh, she might again become an outcast and be forced to live in poverty, but she was inspired and, and clung to Jesus in this very special way and a gift from the Lord to belong to her as his bride. And on April 17, 1680, uh, the Wednesday of Holy Week that year, she died at 3 p.m. She was only 24 years old, and her last words were, Jesus, I love you. And those who were around her at that time gave testimony you know, at her passing 15 minutes after she died, uh, the scars, the smallpox scars that had disfigured her and left her, her sight impaired disappeared and she became radiantly beautiful you know, after her, her death. At World Youth Day in 2002 in Toronto, John Paul II told the young people, I believe it was at the airport when he was leaving, he said, at difficult moments in the church's life, the pursuit of holiness becomes even more urgent. And holiness is not a question of age. It is a matter of living in the Holy Spirit, just as Kateri Tekawitha did here in America and so many other young people have done. So the threats and difficulties we experience is not a time to let off the gas, but is a time that it's more required to live a, to seek the Lord with even greater intensity to live a life of holiness that gives witness to Jesus in this world. And today's gospel fits Kateri's life very well. It's part of the ordinary time cycle, but it, it warns about persecutions. And she was persecuted, suffered for the gospel. In Matthew's gospel here in chapter 10, it begins with the call of the 12, the apostles, meaning the ones who are sent. They're listed by name. And then we had the sending out. We heard that yesterday, uh, to take nothing for the journey to go proclaiming the kingdom of God. So there's this commission with a great urgency. And then today, immediately in the text after the sending, we hear about these promised persecutions. You will be hated by all because of my name because of me, because of your belonging to me, because you're sent by me, because of who I am, what I've done, what I teach, because of, of me, your identity with me, belong to me, you will be persecuted, and we're gonna hear it tomorrow, uh, just as they persecuted me, they'll persecute you as the master, so the slave. So we know we're doing something right if we suffer difficulty in this fallen world because the world's not going to accept the Christian. And he also says to be shrewd as serpents, that we are to use prudence to survive. We're not just to throw away our lives needlessly, but to be shrewd, to, to try to, you know, to be effective in proclaiming the gospel and to escape persecution as best we can. We don't look for it. But he also says to be simple as doves. And the word simple here, the scholars tell us, means to be unmixed, to have pure motives, to be single-minded for their ministry, you know, trusting in the Lord and having faith. That single-mindedness, that single-heartedness for the Lord is not easy to do, I think, especially in this age. We have so many distractions, so many other interests. We could be caught up in so many other things, tied to other things, dragged down by other things. But the believer is to want to seek the Lord to put him first, to seek his will in all things with faith. And then <clears throat> this promise of persecution is to last until uh, the Son of Man comes. End of time. So, <laughs> you know, it's not just a little window here in the beginning of the early church. It's that's for time immemorial. So if you're a believer, you share in this. If you're on mission, you share in this. And we all are on mission in this world. The laity have their mission to transform this temporal sphere, to order it uh, to the gospel, to order it to the kingdom. Sometimes we see behind persecutions of the church, we can see political maneuvering or threats to power or threats uh, to money in some way, I think. You know, in Acts, we see Paul struggling with different groups or individuals. In Ephesus, he 
has uh, this commotion called by Demetrius, who was a silversmith. They had a big temple to Artemis. It was cutting into their, you know, they were making idols to the, this god Artemis. And um, so it was a threat to that trade and maybe to just some were devout believers and so I was overturning their religious values. So we see different reasons for persecution. Today, in the West, we see, I think, a conflict, a conflict between secular Western values and Judeo-Christian values. We're in a time, of course, we can all see it, of extreme change of morality. Today, secular Western culture exalts license to maximize not truly freedom, but license to do what we want. And that's to maximize self-autonomy, uh, self-reliance. In the West here, we, we recognize any true objective moral law, less and less, a moral law that binds everyone. Now, today, we say the law is just from the one who has power to make the law. We profess, like, and give as a goal political utopias to put this group in power, that becomes the goal, and the dignity of the individual is threatened. There's no reference in law to a natural law that comes from God, that's rooted in our human nature, that we can know by right reason, but that comes from God, rooted in him. He underpins all law, all truth. And we find if that isn't recognized, that law so easily just becomes relative, is changed for the sake of those who are in power who want to keep that power. <clears throat> now, right reason, as Thomas would teach, St. Thomas, that you know can know this law, but the trouble is our reason oftentimes is fallen. And without God and revelation, uh, we can mistake that law and get it wrong, as we see so often. I'm always struck, especially living here in Birmingham, you know, that Martin Luther King Jr., in fighting for civil rights in the 60s, he makes an appeal to the natural law. And it's eloquently stated in his letter from a Birmingham jail. He quotes St. Augustine and St. Thomas, that, you know, to to appeal to the natural law for the rights of the individual, the dignity of the human person. And when we push, push God aside, as we've done in the secular West, this law decays, and also we lose sight of who we are, made in his image and likeness. Human dignity suffers. To put it simply, in the West today, we see that nothing is good or evil in itself. There's this vague notion of values <clears throat> that uh, seems to be shifting sands under our feet that's always changing. And then as Christians, we hear, well, just live and let live. But I think oftentimes what they don't see is that it's wrong, morally wrong, to participate in evil or to promote it or to support it in any way. And that puts the Christian in a bind today especially as we see in the values of the sexual revolution that is more and more you know, tumbling and like an avalanche upon us. As I said, we see God as truly the basis of all values, law, and truth. And we lose sight of God, the human being suffers, and we even become incomprehensible to ourselves. We lose a sense of our own dignity, value, and importance. You know, our faith in God reminds us of that, and then we can order a just civilization that protects that dignity, protects especially the marginalized and the least. The saints, and especially those who suffered greatly for the church, you know, they show us the path. They show us and witness to us a life of great faith in clinging to the Lord and putting him first in our life. They show us that Prayer is what strengthens us. Prayer is what guides us and fosters this communion with him to live according to his gospel and to spread it, to be truly missionaries. 
I'm always struck, you know, by some of these saints, the simplicity of their lives, you know, but how much they accomplish for the kingdom, you know, in very poor and difficult circumstances. God is not limited in working in our life in whatever circumstance we're in. As John Paul II said, you know, in, in difficult times of the church, even greater holiness is required, and he can still uh, work to us in marvelous ways. May we be faithful to that gospel and trust in him and follow him.